My name is Diana Downing, and I'm on the ministerial staff at St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church in Glencoe. I also have the distinct privilege of serving, serving as the connectional treasurer of the Richard Allen Young Adult Council for the AME Church. I'm also a second year Master of Divinity student at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Join me as I consider how everything that has breath praises the Lord. The 150th Psalm, verse 6 reads, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In our faith communities, we understand at creation's beginning that God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then man became a living being. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I know that it is the breath of life, God breathing in my nostrils, that keeps me sustained and keeps me alive. In Hebrew, the word ruach means breath, wind, or spirit. It is in and from this ruach, the spirit of the living God, that I find my peace, my stillness, during this new meditation and collective renewing of our mind. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 reads, And the spirit of the Lord, the breath of the Lord, shall rest upon him. The spirit, the breath of wisdom and understanding. The spirit, the breath of counsel and might. The spirit, the breath of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Family, we were first confronted with a disease that was designed to take our breath away but we are now faced with a much more deadly attack to our bodies and to our collective breaths in the dis-ease of racism. It has continued to attack our most vulnerable as they simply try to breathe and exist. So I ask, do you have breath? Are you still breathing? The very act of breathing is a radical demonstration of our faith. Perhaps in this moment of our collective history as a nation and as communities of faith, we are being asked to breathe life into places that choose to silence Black voices and Black bodies. George Floyd uttered the words, I can't breathe, a total of 16 times during the harrowing murder revealed in eight minutes and 46 seconds to the world. Family, it is our breath that gives us wisdom. It is our breath that gives us the collective strength to speak out against racism, injustice, and inequality. It is our breath that gives us courage to speak up in our homes, our congregations, and in our communities that Black lives matter. Let us demonstrate our faith in our breath, in our words, in our actions. Join me. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Hello, my name is Reverend Dwayne Gary, proud pastor of St. Paul AME Church here in Glencoe, Illinois. I want to thank Minister Deanna for an outstanding thought and meditation on today. It has touched my spirit and I know it has touched yours. I want to share with you uh, two passages of scripture. The first being Psalms 102, verse seven, excuse me, verse 27, and Hebrew 13 and eight. First Psalms 102, refrain 27 says, they will perish, but you endure. They will wear out like a garment. You change them like clothing and they passed away, but you are the same and your years have no end. Hebrews 13, eight says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The moment that is the Lord's um, for this interfaith 
sermon talk is titled The Same God. The Same God. It was the most profound question that I have ever heard asked in a workshop. Some times ago, I, back in Michigan, I heard Dr. Ricky Woods, who was the presenter, he asked the group this question, do black people and white people serve different gods? He asked us that question after speaking to us how heroic the capture of Africans on the west coast of Africa was and how violent it was to herd them into slave houses in Ghana and other countries. He shared how heartbreaking it was for him to stand there at the place called the door of no return. The slaves would be baptized and go through that door and be put on ships that was designed and destined for death. Dr. Wood said, the white captures on the deck of the ship, once they had secured their human cargo, black bodies, male and females, down in the hall of the ship, they would be on the top of the deck celebrating. They would eat, they would drink, and they would pray. They lifted their voices to their God to pray. Pray for a safe trip home. They would pray that their families were well. They would pray that their human merchandise will be safe and will yield a good profit. That's why they lifted up their voices. Yet while they were lifting up their voices on the deck, if you listen real closely, you can hear coming from the hall of the ship through the small breathing holes of the deck of the ship, a faint, almost muted sound of a human offering. The offerings of caramel, mocha, and chocolate-covered cargo, black men and women who were chained together to one another and literally packed in like sardines. They were laying in their vomit, laying in their urine, laying in their feces, yet they too, while the people on the deck were celebrating, they were in the halls of the ship chain, and they too had the audacity to sing and to pray to their God. However, this group was not praying simply for a safe trip or for profit. No, this group was praying for survival. They were praying for their life. Things were so bad and they needed assurance that the god of their native land could still see them and hear them in the hall of the ship through a little breathing hole of the floor of the deck of the ship they were lifting up their songs they were lifting up their prayers from the halls to be seen and to be heard not by those who captured them who were on the deck praying to their god no they were praying to their god the one who have placed life and rhythm in their soul. Dr. Woods had described the tension of this scene and said to us, now, do you think they were praying to the same God? Do black people and white people serve the same God? I should never forget that pondering question for it shook me from the center of my circumference. Do black people and white people serve a different God? And though I was shook that day by the question, I did not have to search far. Why? Because the, the question that was asked had my mind do a rewind through the tunnels of time into the hallway of black history. Remembering the time and the images of water hoses being turned on us dogs attacking and, and biting us, having the, remembering the time and the images of being beat with billy cubs and yanked out of our vehicles to the ground by our head, being removed 
from the coffee counters, having crosses burnt in front of our homes and seeing dangling bodies from trees. And from my perspective, there seems to be a difference between their God and my God. It seems that their God sanctioned people to be dehumanized and having practiced that what they called uh, manifest destiny, which allowed them because of the color of their skin to use the power to kill and rape indigenous people and the resources of Africa and Americans. Forced the First Nation Indians into reservation and enslaving Africans and using their skills that they learned from the Africans and from the First Nation people that they cultivated their land. Their God sanctioned free human resource and labor for 400 years. And for 50 more years caused us to be discriminated. While our God, the one who had compassion for the lost, for the last, and for the least. Our God was the one who provided hope in the midst of the storm. Our God was the one who helped us uh, through the legalization of racism and discrimination and through murder, murder. Our God seemingly had compassion and took the time to sow and secure in the hymns of our hearts and in the seats of our soul enough grace and peace to give us joy even in our toughest days. Their God was one of conquer. Our God was one of compassion. Their God was about securing power and our God was about surviving persecution. Their God was on the deck while our God was in the halls of the ship. I will never forget that question 10 years ago because it shook the center of my circumference in my soul. Do white people and black people serve the same God? And honestly, when we reflect and recall these past few days and weeks of events have bombarded me and reminded me of that question because of the images have messed me up. Images is a visible representation of something. A image is a picture that has been created or copied and stored in some type of form or fashion. Images, you've seen them during the COVID-19 where black and brown communities have the highest number of COVID-19 then than those in other sections of our town that are predominantly white. You've seen the, the pictures, you've seen the images, testing being done in certain areas that the people are lighter than others. These images makes me hear that question. Images like Ahmaud Arbery being killed simply for jogging down the streets, even if he was on the construction site. He was trying to, maybe he was trying to look at what an American dream was supposed to look like for him, but the dream turned into America's nightmare because he was killed simply by jogging. The image of Breonna Taylor who could not even sleep at night resting from her job where she helps people for, for a living, but in her own apartment, she couldn't even get the help because she was killed by people who were supposed to protect and serve. That image, you've seen it, eight minutes and 46 seconds, which George Floyd was killed. In fact, he told the officers, I can't breathe. I heard the other day Reverend Al Sharpton say he narrated his death. How am I supposed to sit here knowing that I have a son who loves to jog? I have a son who loves to help people. I have a son who loves to drive around in the city with his friends. And all I have are these images displayed constantly. 
And if that doesn't help you, how about the image of the police pushing a senior citizen down, busting his head on the hot concrete as they stepped over him and looked down. The image that makes me ask the question. And if you're still wondering about the question, maybe this next image that I share with you, it blew my mind. When the president of the United States decided to use his power as chief commander in chief to move people from a peaceful protest outside of the White House. He used military to remove a crowd so he can walk from the Rose Garden to St. John's Church so that he can give a manifesto of peace? No. So that he can unite the nation? No. He simply wanted to hold up the Holy Writ that he might appear as if he is a servant of the most high God. I have the same pondering questions from years ago. Do we serve the same God? Now, before you get up and walk away, before you turn off whatever platform you're using to watch this, I'm not trying to separate people. No, not, not, not at all. Uh, let me just turn my thought right here because I've heard the outrage from the pastor of St. John, the bishop of that particular parish. I heard the outrage from even some of our white evangelical brothers and sisters. I heard the outrage when they all said that this image did not represent the God we all serve. Yet the question still looms, do we serve the same God? This is the question that was there in Psalms 102, where there was an afflicted man praying. He was faint, and he poured out his prayers before God. It was a prayer of hope, but then it, it made a sudden shift to an expression of confidence in the people's future. The afflicted man used, it, used language and imagery to shape and tell his story. He used language and imageries like smoke, withered, uh, withered grass, the owl and the lonely bird eat ashes for bread and the even shadow. Then the shift. Why the shift? Because in the face of crisis throughout the generations, the people of God have found hope and strength in the conviction that God reigned. Therefore, their future can be entrusted and should be entrusted to God. The future of the, of the people depended on God's compassion and God's favor. And as the afflicted man reviewed his current situation and circumstance, he concluded that enough is enough. And at that point, his reality be, uh, began, began to view an opportunity for God to perform a new exodus, a new outcome. And the church today needs to profess and find a hope within these words of God because there is a promise for all of us who do serve the same God. The focus of the afflicted man was shifted dr dramatically because when he said, you, O Lord, in verse 12 and 13, it changed the you to God. At that moment in time, the you became God. So when it got down to verse 25, the afflicted man said these words, how long God laid, long ago God laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of God's hands. They will perish, but God endure. They will wear out their garments. God changed them like clothing and they pass away, but God is the same. God is the same and God's years have no end. Does that sound familiar? I'm about to shout out my shoes. It's the same question that was there in the New Testament in the Hebrew church when the writer wrote to the Hebrew people. They said, he said, I know that you're upset. I know you're facing persecution. I know it doesn't look 
as good as you thought it should be. I know some of you are ready to denounce your religion. I know you're ready to quit. Maybe you are protesting. Maybe you're marching in the streets. Maybe you're in uproar. Maybe you're crying like we are crying out today. There's a lot going on. And to that point, he wrote to them. He said to them, the first thing I want you to do is remember what your parents taught you. Let me stop right there because one of the reasons some of us come to church is because our parents and grandparents drug us to church so, so that we can meet their God and their God became our God. Y'all missed the transition. Here it is. When we go through some stuff in life, we can remember and depend on the same God. Their God became our God. And when their God became our God, we did not praise God for their experiences. No, we praise God for our own experiences because we have learned to have a relationship with God for ourselves. The Bible reminds us that God, we need to remember the God of our parents. We need to remember that God told us about the God of the same being same yesterday and today. Let me start right there. God is the same yesterday and today. And this text is in the same cause. We can't get to forever more yet because the writer wants to remind us that God is the same. What does that mean? It means we have the same faith uh, that our forefathers and foremothers had. We serve the same God that our parents serve. Whether he is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, he's still the same God. They went through some stuff worse than us, but yet they still serve the same God. They praised him, they, we thanked him, but yet and still they trusted in the same God. We saw it just this past weekend, blacks and whites marching together, trusting in the same God. We stayed at home during the pandemic, trusting in the same God. We, we have hope that the culture would change because we all trust in the same God, because we believe a brighter day is coming. God is the God of yesterday, today, and we worship the God of power. We worship a God of change. We worship a God of compassion, and we worship the same God of justice. Come on and tell somebody at your house, God does not go out of style. Come on and say it. God does not go out of style. Jeans may go out of style. Shoes may go out of style. But God is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Don't, do not think that this, what we're going through is out of God's control. It may be out of our control, but it's not out of God's control. I know you're nervous. I know you're shedding tears. You're wondering what's next. We got to still believe that God is in control. I recall the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said that the arc of the moral universal is long, but it bends towards justice and truth crushes against the ground shall rise again. What is the bend of the ark? I'm glad you asked. The bend of the ark is the movement of tens and thousands of progressive Jews across America who is working together to ensure and achieve our vision. What is the vision? To transform communities and cultures. What is the, the vision to be inclusive and have equality? What is the vision to support dignity of every person across race? class, gender, and faith. I believe we shall get there and we shall win at the end. I just want to remind you that the God we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That the God back then is the God right now and forevermore.